So hello everyone. We'll, we'll as usual start in with a short introduction. Welcome to the Sofia Crypto Meetup event number 38, which will be dedicated to these three amazing projects. We have uh, three developers uh, in front of us uh, who will be talking on different topics related to, the, to these three projects. As usual, we will start with uh, the biggest news in May, which uh, is something that is voted on by the community in, uh, in the Sofia Crypto Meetup group. And that's a prerogative of Ivan. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, so as always, we, we, we put a, a poll in the Facebook group, and the community votes on what's the most important thing that has happened in May. Uh, this month, we have the Wadex uh, exchange launching on the Eternity blockchain, the Binance hack, and Coinbase uh, allegedly acquiring Zappo. I don't know if the, the, the deal actually went through yet. So, uh, yeah, so Wadex launching on Eternity net, uh, mainnet. Uh, I've heard that there is some issue at the moment of, of it working on the Eternity chain, but I actually tested it just for you. Uh, where is that? Yeah, yeah, here. So I bought half a, half an OMG. It works. Uh, the cool thing, at least, uh, the, the the coolest thing about it for me is the cross chain capability, which I haven't seen in a Dex. Um, I might have missed something, but so far all the Dexes are. Uh, related to a specific chain. So there is like a DEX that works on ne NEO tokens, a DEX that works on uh, Ethereum tokens, uh, the ERC20s, but there hasn't been a DEX that works on multiple chains. Uh, another reason why this is big news here, it's, uh, yeah, because, you know, the people from the team are, an active mem are all active members of our community, so we have to support them. <laughs> uh, there is a lot of new co cool shit coming from, from them. Uh, you can check them out. They, they'll have like collectibles exchange and uh, the, the atomic swap cross-chain thing I mentioned. Uh, I would like to also uh, add something to this. So what we are planning to do with the Wadex team is actually have uh, start a little period of testing of the Eternity uh, decentralized exchange. And uh, people who are participating will be uh, rewarded with some AE tokens for just simple actions. The ones who are interested in getting, providing more detailed feedback in, uh, in the form of uh, actually filling, filling in a form and providing recommendations will get uh, a bit more tokens for, for this effort. Uh, we're going to launch this hopefully in June. And anyone from the community is welcome to participate. It will be announced in all uh, the Eternity communication channels. And yes, that was my little point. Cool. Uh, free stuff, always good, right? <laughs> so uh, moving on, uh, the reason why we need a DEX. Uh, so Binance got hacked early this month. Uh, Actually, the hack itself, at least I don't think it's big news because that happens all the time and it continues to happen and probably will continue to happen. Uh, the size is, is, is pretty okay. It's uh, 7,000 Bitcoin, which for this year, I think it's, it's, it's the biggest one so far, but we'll see prices going up. Maybe the hacks will go up as well. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, so yeah, uh, the, the actually what uh, what was very interesting around it was the the so-called reorg debate. Uh, basically, CZ, the CEO of Binance, uh, said that uh, he's exploring the opportunity to uh, roll back transactions, basically on on, on the Bitcoin mainnet, uh, which sparked a massive discussion. Uh, basically, everybody was or at least the more prominent figures in the space were saying that that's a, a ridiculous idea. And basically to save uh, 40 million or, or 7,000 Bitcoin, it's not worth it to compromise the network. Uh, because basically if, if one entity being Binance can actually decide and roll back the, the chain, you know, the whole being decentralized thing is, is not really viable. Uh, luckily, 
he came to his senses. Uh, this didn't happen. A lot of people argued that it could not. Uh, I think the best uh, explanation was uh, provided by uh, Katie Vu, I, I believe, on Twitter, and like she was doing the math, and it it turned out that uh, like it was a few a few hours was the horizon where it was economically viable to invest the money to roll the transaction. So basically, after a few hours. Even for that amount, it's not worth to try to, to roll back. Uh, which is one of the reasons why for larger transactions, uh, usually counterparties require more confirmations on the chain. Uh, and the last thing that uh, you guys and girls considered important this month is the Coinbase acquisition of Zappo. Uh, what it is, Coinbase is the biggest on-ramp globally. Uh, on -ramp being a, a fiat uh, to crypto interface. Uh, and they are acquiring one of the top uh, custody, uh, custody providers and one of the earliest ones. You know, Zappo is a leader in cold storage and, and just keeping users' coins safe. They have biometrics and all this stuff. Uh, you know, the, the interesting part is that Fidelity was another bidder. So Fidelity Investment, for those who don't know, this is one of the four biggest custodians in the world of traditional assets. Uh, They're also launching a product uh, related to custody of digital assets. This is part of the, the so-called institutionals coming in. Uh, but uh, what's even more interesting on, on sort of ideological level, it's the, the idea that the average user doesn't want to keep their own keys. They want to have someone to, to do all, all that for them. Uh, and this move shows that entities will tend to, to uh, aim for centralization because of, of economies of scale, etc. So they will naturally aim to be monopolies. Uh, especially in an in a industry that's somehow naturally re related to the internet, which creates natural monopolies. Uh, that's it for the news. Oh. <laughs> well, well, this is, um, these are actually just the, the two graphs we show every time, and you can see the Bitcoin is yeah, uh, doing better now a little bit, uh, but just may, like just have a look uh, or notice that the maximum price there is it's not the maximum that has been reached, which was 20,000. And this is about, I don't know, $11,000 on the day that we organized that meetup. Um, so this graph looks really good. <laughs> but <laughs> actually, maybe it's not. And this is the infamous uh, middle finger by Ethereum. Um, yeah, Ethereum also a little bit going better, uh, like doing better. But I think this was kind of the, also the, the really the actual peak of Ethereum when, when it, it reached it. I think 1,400 was the peak, but this is, I mean, this is closer than Bitcoin's uh, situation, like in the peak. So maybe things are improving now. And does this, why does, okay. And now, we now go to the actual, uh, the main part of, of the, the meetup, which is the discussion with the three developers, but there, there should, oh yeah, this one, this one, I missed this one. So this is the panel, and the panel will have uh, all these parts in it, app scaling, decentralization, and protocol upgrades. Uh, it will be dedicated to these three uh, projects, and we have our amazing panelists, Ivo Gurgiev, Dimitr, Always problem with that name, even for a Bulgarian, Jurenov and Milen Radkov, which is a super easy name to pronounce. And I'll ask the, the panelists to just go in front and yes, yes. Anywhere you want, guys. And we will start with introductions to who they are and what are they doing. And the first part will be just introduction to the blockchains that they are going to be representing. So we're going to start. We're going to start with Demeter. Short this, uh, introduction by him, and then with Ivo and Milen. So hi all. Hi all. Um, I'm really excited to see so many people today. It's not something we see in every meetup. So my name is Demeter. I'm CEO and founder at Infinitech Swaps. We are outsourcing company for blockchain 
developments, and I'm also founder at Use Bulgaria. Hello everyone, um, I'm Ivo from Adex. I'm the founder of Adex, which is a um, protocol for trustless advertising. And um, I'm going to be talking about Ethereum. And the reason for that is that we've been developing on Ethereum since 2017. And we've explored many, many chains and we've never found anything more useful, even though we found technically better solutions, but more on that later. Hello everyone, my name is Milen Radkov. I'm founder of Hack. Um, we are providing also outsourcing services for blockchain startups and enterprises. We are developing smart contracts and decentralized apps for clients. Um, actually, I'm coming from Ethereum world and yeah, a few months ago I started developing on Eternity and today I'm be I'm gonna be advocating for Eternity and basically taking part in the discussion on behalf of Eternity. I'll help you with that, or I'll try at least. <laughs> so we can move to part one, which is the intro to the different blockchains. So again, we can start with... So um, I have a question. How many of you know what EOS means? Yeah. So EOS as abbreviation stands for Exponential Operating System. Uh, and this is the thing that with the things inside the network, like resources we are using, CPU, net, uh, bandwidth, and RAM, uh, is going to be more clear if you start with that. EOS stands for Exponential Operating System. Uh, I, I'm not sure what I can say about use at the moment. <laughs> I mean, I could talk after we cheat one, but... It's exponential. Yeah, yeah it's exponential. Okay, I mean, sure. <laughs> um, so Ethereum was started back in, I think, 2014. And um, the thing that I want to emphasize is that it really was a backslash to Bitcoin, but not exactly. Uh, originally, it was meant to be an improvement on Bitcoin. Um, but Vitalik wasn't, Vitalik's ideas weren't so popular with the Bitcoin core team. Uh, and this team to this day is a team that's very conservative and that's not a bad thing. Um, Bitcoin is very good for many things. Uh, but ultimately Vitalik didn't manage to put his ideas through with the Bitcoin core team. So that's why uh, Ethereum was born. And in the beginning it looked really, it, it looked really scruffy and like an amateur project. Uh, but over time it evolved into an amazing ecosystem of um, many projects which are amazingly useful. For example, MakerDAO and DAI, which is the only decentralized stablecoin that's working. Uh, Uniswap, which is the only decentralized uh, exchange that's actually usable, arguably, even though I'm an advisor for Wadex, and I told them to, I told them to basically copy Uniswap, but yeah, um, and so that's basically it. It started really like in a really basic way uh, as a backslash to Bitcoin, uh, and then it evolved into what it is today. Okay, Eternity. So the founder of Eternity, Yanni, was in communication with uh, Vitalik who founded Ethereum. So basically he is in the space from very early stage. And actually he managed to see everything that happened in the blockchain space. So he decided to create Eternity, which is aiming to fix the scalability issues and all other issues that other blockchains has. So Eternity basically with few words is a scalabil scaling platform for developing smart contracts and decentralized apps, which also provides us with lots of other treats. <laughs> All right, yeah, great. we'll get into that. <laughs> okay, so that's a, that's a nice introduction, and we can maybe go to the part, the second part, which is applications. And again, we can start with EOS, and yeah, finish with Eternity. Oh man, uh, what do you want to say about the applications? <laughs> yeah, no, because there is, at the moment, there is a lot of application right now on EOS. And the thing I love about the application on EOS is that we have applications that can 
can be used like a normal ones. Because when we want our user to interact with the application, we, ha we want the user to experience the same way he used a normal app. And there is lots of things here that uh, are important, like performance, user experience. Uh, there is probably probably one of the most famous apps right now on use are Karma. It was one of the first one. Another one is Sense, which is like a messenger, but is implemented on use. And the whole idea is that you don't have a third part side that, for example, Facebook, that could use your data or to save every, uh, every message that you are sending to your friends. Um, I could say about Karma that uh, it's actually the first app on use that is providing everything that is needed to work like a normal app. I'm not sure if you're all familiar how um, how use works. In the beginning, there, there were some issues that you need to pay for use account, and you need to ha take some use tokens for you, so you can use CPU and other resources. At the moment, Karma provides everything like Facebook login, and you actually at the moment, what they're missing is a really strong marketing so they can actually bring the user base. They have everything to be a competitive startup to a normal apps like Facebook or Instagram. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's a lot to say about apps on Ethereum, and I'm obviously going to plug in my own project here, but um, but first I definitely need to mention the big ones, and uh, the biggest one, as I said, is MakerDAO, and the, the biggest, um, the most important thing is that uh, this is basically uh, a decentralized bank um, in which you have a token which is always worth one dollar, and it's all done through economic incentives and economic principles, uh, and you're in total control of, of your funds. Uh, it, it's done through collateralized debt positions, which is an amazing uh, economic concept, and I think it's the only, um, probably the only technical solution which combines economics and, um, uh, and technology in such a way, other than Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, that brings such a valuable thing to the world. And this valuable thing is um, a token which we can all interact with because it has a stable value, but it's still entirely in your control. Um, then the second one that, that I want to mention is uh, Spunk Chain. Uh, and this is basically like, <laughs> basically like Chaturbate, but, um, <laughs> but on Ethereum and really more premium. Uh, but why I want to mention it is because of payment channels, which means that you can do micropayments at no cost. Um, and then the third one, um, before ADEX, um, would be Funfair. And Funfair is like a casino system, so it's gambling. Um, but it's also amazing because uh, you have full control over your funds, you have full uh, guaranteed randomness. Uh, and the randomness is guaranteed on what they call a fate channel, which is like a payment channel, but with randomness. Uh, so you know that you're not gonna get cheated by the casino, which is really important. Uh, which means there is the story stable channel, like the, the stable channels there. Which channels? The stable ones. The fate, you, made, you mean the fate? Yeah. Yeah, yeah fate channels. Off, off chain. The, the yeah, 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 yeah. yeah they, it's they state, channels. state channels. Yes, which are, in, in this case, they're fate channels, which means state channels with randomness. And then finally, the reason I want to plug in ADEX, other than being um, my project, is um, because it's usable exactly like, uh, like a normal app. Um, and uh, you can use it without knowing what Ethereum is, without knowing what Ether is, without needing to have Ether, without needing to have MetaMask. And this is all done uh, in a completely trustless way through a smart contract. It uses signed messages uh, in a way that, for example, you authenticate someone else to pay for your gas fees, but you don't even know that. Uh, the only thing you need to know is that you pay a small, a small network fee, um, which is in some sense. And we can speak in sense because we're using DAI. 
um, which is also great for user experience. And the other thing is the payment channels, which is a form of, of state channels, um, which allow us to do micro payments for advertising, which means that the publisher and the advertiser are always going to have real-time reporting guaranteed, and the publisher's revenues are always guaranteed. No one can take them away from you. No one has control of your revenues. Uh, and finally, I want to say that we can do only with two servers, which cost us uh, like $70. Um, we can do 7,000 transactions per second, um, 7,000 micro payments, but it could be larger payments too, and that's through payment channels. And uh, this is more than most blockchains can achieve. And we are doing all of this while keeping the Ethereum's security underneath, which is the second most secure blockchain after Bitcoin, if you, uh, if you count by mining power. Hmm. <laughs> Oh yeah, I missed that one, and the reason I missed it is because I used it for 10 days and then I forgot about it. Um, <laughs> like most people. Yeah. The concept is amazing and it proved a lot of things. Uh, it, it, proved, it, it, pro it proved that the developers of CryptoKitties cannot really develop scalable dApps. Um, it proved that NFTs are amazing. Um, and it proved that Ethereum can get user traction. So that's it. It was a first good, is it a good first start? Yeah, definitely, definitely. So given the fact that Eternity is quite a young project, uh, there are not so many apps out there yet, but uh, the ecosystem is quite good. There is Starfleet, which is an um, incubator for blockchain projects. And uh, this year was the second uh, Starfleet, and there are lots of projects that are currently building on Eternity, and we are awaiting them to release something this or the next year, which will be useful and usable on chain. Um, as I said, Eternity is uh, quite young, but there are still uh, some projects that are usable. For example, the base app, which is a browser wallet combined with uh, the ability for you to import your, uh, basically, the wallet can house your app application and basically you can have similar to an operation system that you have on your mobile phone, which basically handles all your wallet logic and your account information, interact with every application that you need and want. And uh, for now, there is uh, the hybrid voting application, which basically is an app uh, that gives you the opportunity to vote and uh, apply your, like, this is a way for governing the protocol and uh, provide users and investors a way to um, vote for changes on the protocol and, uh, yeah, vote for stuff that, uh, that is uh, important at the moment. Um, yeah. Waydex. Waydex, yeah, are currently uh, building on, <laughs> sorry, are currently, currently building on Eternity as well. They will be, yeah, they launched and they will be soon accessible. And basically every one of you here can interact with their exchange and try the cross-chain uh, stuff. <laughs> Do you want to say something? Yes. So about b all of those three things. So the first thing is the base app. Uh, actually, uh, we developed this at first as a um, progressive app, which means that it has the functionality uh, in browser without the need to install any kind of application on your phone. And the idea behind this is that if, uh, for example, the App Store has some uh, issue with your app, they can at any time uh, like stop it or, or make it unavailable, which could kill your project, more or less. Um, and uh, it's currently running uh, as a, as a um, um, progressive app. But yesterday, uh, we introduced the base app in the App Store and the Google Play Store. It, it has the absolutely the same functionality, or at least 98% the same uh, functionality. And the idea behind this was uh, so that like, people who like to kind of find it in the App Store can install it uh, on their uh, phone, but this is actually not needed. 
um, if you're using the progressive app. And uh, the voting app, which Milan mentioned, was super exciting, super interesting also, because it provided a very user-friendly way to provide a formal vote on the blockchain that cannot be cheated. So you vote with your tokens, one token, one vote. And you can do this from your mobile device. It, it takes about, if you have the tokens already on the account, it takes about maybe less than one minute to provide a formal vote that, that is recorded on the blockchain and with that like immediately available in terms of information. So you have real time uh, information about what the voting outcome is. And third thing was, uh, yes, Wadex. Uh, which, uh, as I said, it hasn't really launched yet. We, we have this testing phase first, and after that, uh, when it's available on the mainnet, I will let you guys know, and you can test how it works. What I'm looking forward in Wadex is um, the ability to actually exchange Ethereum and Bitcoins to, to AE tokens uh, like, uh, like a functionality. And hopefully this will be able, like we will be able to kind of have this upon launch. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to this. And as Milan said, there are a number of other applications which are coming. Uh, and another one that is very close to being completed is AMP, AmpNet, um, which is um, energy, tr well, I'm not sure how to explain it, but energy, Energy cooperative, maybe, is the, the best thing. We have a lot of information there in the forum uh, about, about it. Uh, and hopefully, yes, we'll have some information once it launches. So I'm not sure which is going to come out formally first. Is it going to be Wadex or AmpNet? But I'll let you guys know. So yes, maybe we can have um, like a short discussion for this part. Uh, so that you can have ask questions because we're just talking and talking. Um, yeah, we have one question up there. All right. So my question is uh, for each of the, uh, you know, platforms. What's the most popular application, and how many users does it have it per day? Um, so we can start with Eternity, like how many people are using the base uh, app, I'm not really sure like, to be honest, but it's more or less an account manager which incorporates an app store inside of it. And um, in, I can give you, for example, in the, in, the, uh, voting, in the voting app, 13 million tokens voted, uh, and about 250 different accounts voted in the voting app. And, but there was, this was a period of one week, and this is more or less the first, if you want to call it an app, uh, first app that was uh, like made available apart from the base app, which is the account manager. Yep. Who's next? I can go oh, elaborate. Oh, sorry. Elaborate. Sorry, if you want to say something. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I will allow myself to uh, promote something. We are currently building a browser extension wallet for Eternity, and uh, the current a user base is 38. <laughs> Thank you for this. Yeah, it's, it, <laughs> it's still better yet. It's been developed uh, for a few weeks now, so ah, yes. I don't uh, expect much user base, but uh, yeah, 38 people for a few weeks. <laughs> so um, I'm going to be a smart ass, and because Milan brought up uh, brought up browser extensions. I'm going. I'm going to bring up MetaMask, um, which just recently published a blog post on their users uh, usage statistics. Has anyone seen it? Yep. No. Do you know the exact numbers? One million and something. One million and something. Okay. Could so yeah. Active uh, users. Active? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, yes. Biggest, like, extension, like, yeah, and you could count you. Uh, users. Uh, users based on the. Chrome Web Store. Or yeah, based on the Chrome Web Store. So, um, but wait, I'll, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. So, um, MetaMask has one has like one million users, and um, it, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna get to Spunk Chain. So, um, the 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 thing is that. I'm pretty familiar with it, <laughs> but actually, 
the, the, the CEO of Spunk, the CEO of Spunk Chain is our advisor, so, and we're quite close. Um, so the, the, the thing is, yeah, he is our, he, he is one of our, he is our main developer, and he has a picture with one of the porn stars. Nice. So. <laughs> so everybody watches porno, great. Who watches more porno? <laughs> so yeah, let's, let's get back to the topic. The thing that I really want to say uh, is that all of the ways that we count users is wrong. Um, we, we tend to count users by blockchain addresses or by transactions, uh, and this is so wrong because this is like, uh, there was a tweet which said that uh, counting blockchain app usage by uh, counting on-chain transactions is like counting usage of cars by the time the times people go to the G to the GMV. Uh, it's pretty much the same, or the time you go to court. Um, so a properly designed blockchain application should require an actual transaction quite rarely. Uh, and an example of this is payment channels, where you can have a channel open and transact until forever, uh, knowing that you can close the channel at any point and have your money. This is cryptographically secure. You know that if you want to settle the channel, you can, and you can get the money. So why do we count uh, usage by uh, the actual on-chain usage if, for example, a project like Spunkchain or Addix on, or Funfair uh, may never settle a channel? Um, it could have like three transactions on chain and this could mean that it has three, three million actual user interactions and um, half a million of users. Um, so I really don't like the way we count uh, users at the moment. All of the sites are based on, on this metric, uh, which is not cool. Um, and the Ethereum apps are way, uh, way above others in terms of usage uh, and MetaMask proves this. I don't have any other proof other than MetaMask. Uh, and the, uh, the funds locked up on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, MakerDAO has right now like millions and millions of, of Ether locked up, uh, and other projects have millions as well. Um, so if you, if you look at how, how much funds are locked up, it even beats the Lightning Network. Although this could be, this is a totally separate topic because the Lightning Network doesn't need that, that, much, fund lock, that much funds locked up. Uh, but yeah, I just think the way we count users is wrong, and that's, that's all. I could go with Cutter, uh, which is like the MetaMask version for use. And the reason for that is you can use Cutter not only for use, but you can actually use it for Ethereum, you can actually use it for Bitcoin. I think they have now implementation for Loom. And they are currently implementing other blockchains, so you have everything in one place. But I'm not sure how many like percentage of the users or like an actual number they are using the, the app. So I will go with, uh, with another app, which is Karma. And for me, Karma is one of the most famous apps in use. The first reason is that is, it was the first one. The second one is that it's one of the apps that have real uh, market value, not like just a gambling app that everyone uses and use or any other blockchain. And uh, Karma, I think they have between 1,000 and uh, 1,500 daily active users, which is a lot for a, an app from that kind. App, Karma is like a social network it's, it's a social app on the use. So I believe that they're currently missing the user base. But I know Dallas, which is their CEO, and he's marketing guru, and all they need is just a few months to scale the app. OK, other question? Yes. Um, my question is, if you think about way in the future where this technology is already mature, uh, which possible application do you think will be the most widely used and why? Uh, of, of a smart contract platform. Nice. Maybe settling, set settlement, maybe. If blockchains are not like easy to scale up on-chain, 
payment channels and state channels will be the way to go for scalability. So maybe smart contracts will be used for settling uh, terms and like opening and closing state channels. At least this is my view. Um, so I think that we have to define state channels. And what I mean by that is, uh, sorry, not state channels, smart contracts. Uh, what I mean by that is people imagine smart contracts as this amazing magic thing that can replace contracts. Uh, but it's really just um, a more like, a, a more flexible way to manage funds. So everything that has to do with funds, on-chain funds, so basically Ether or, or Bitcoin, anything, assets. digital assets, yeah, yeah, NFTs, whatever. Uh, anything that's related to digital assets, um, if, you can buy, if you can connect this to a smart contract and bind some logic to a smart contract, then that's the best way to do it. Um, and it has many benefits in the real world. For example, um, payment processors can at any time suspend uh, your account or banks can at any time suspend your account and for some people and for some industries this is a huge problem. Uh, it may not be a huge problem for the average person uh, but if you are running something legal but something legal that is not liked uh, by the banks and again I'm sorry for repeating this but spunk chain um, <laughs> and uh, there are many other cases uh, advertising as well um, where intermediaries can just take allow themselves to take a huge ch uh, chunk out of your funds uh, and any case like that where there's payments and there's people who can manipulate the payments or have some control over that flow of money, any case like that, smart contracts are a possible solution and you should look at smart contracts just like an extension to normal transactions, just, just like smart transactions. And uh, yeah, I guess that's pretty much it. Yes, yeah, so, so, so for me, I think there are two types of dApps. One that is going to be used by the public, like let's say a social network, and one uh, that the other type which is going to be used by the businesses. I believe in the long term, uh, probably uh, I think the, the type of dApps that are used by the businesses, because let's say if you have supply chain, you want everything to be transparent. And I believe in the future we are going to see more and more companies using the blockchain technology in order to, to have actual idea what is happening in their supply chain, because this is really important. And I believe other industries like healthcare needs the blockchain industry, uh, the blockchain technology. And I believe that supply chain healthcare is going to be one of the, one of the, this type of dApps that are going to have more usage. Uh, if you are talking as a user base, probably this is going to be like social network or games, uh, but it really depends um, of the type of the dApp we are talking about. I'm, I'm very sorry, I need, I need to add something. Um, so the problem of applications of smart contracts and applications of blockchain technology is that you always need this magical hypothetical thing called oracles in order to connect any real world event uh, to your thing. So if you're doing governance, uh, you either have to do it one token, one vote, which has many flows, uh, or connect it to an identity, which we cannot solve identity at the moment on, on blockchain. We cannot say this is a particular person, and this particular person can prove this anonymously. It's impossible. Um, it's possible through some governments like Estonia where everyone has digital ID, so it's possible to prove that you are a person and you are a unique person anonymously. But in general, this problem of connecting blockchains to real world things is really complicated and, pro and probably unsolvable. Um, so the difference with money is that money is just a number that is safeguarded by the network and everyone agrees to the same number for the same account. So this is why anything related to payments and money is a good application of the blockchain and everything else is currently hypothetical. Because yeah. <laughs> you said that we have not solved yet the, the problem with unique users. There, there is an event by Block One this Saturday. Uh, they're going to introduce lots of new stuff, uh, and hopefully, we could see something like that. Every, 
every, every country has known it's person. not, but but then you can put it cryptographically, like you can do it like in the government. And then the government can manipulate it. <coughs> okay, I, I'm I'm more interested on uh, architecture and performance because what I know, what you mentioned, is that uh, each each peer keep uh, all the registry, right? All the chain. And. Are there some uh, not for not uh, because if you have uh, a lot of uh, transactions between the peers? Yeah, there are there are so there is, yeah. Yeah, right. good. So we're going to the next part, which is kind of related to this. Yeah, it's, it's very yeah. Much related scalability. This. So uh, you, you, you have a chance to, to, to answer this question. And uh, yeah, maybe the first person to speak, you should explain why scalability is important on the base layer or like can it be achieved on second layer solutions etc okay so it all started with bitcoin <laughs> <laughs> yeah in bitcoin we have a block which contains transactions on every 10 minutes and each block is one megabytes worth of data so it only can store a certain amount of transactions in it and uh, the idea is the, the more people are using the blockchain, the more transactions we have, so the more uh, faster we need to process them. But in Bitcoin, this was uh, and still is part of the protocol, one block at each 10 minutes. So one megabyte? Yeah, one megabyte. Yeah, not counting the forks. <laughs> So the idea is so, uh, on-chain scalability is pretty hard to achieve because uh, everything is related to how fast we can uh, synchronize all this and how fast uh, this can scale up. So the bottleneck of Bitcoin, for example, and part of Ethereum is uh, this uh, yeah, transactions processing. Uh, yeah. I, I'm not gonna go into details. Maybe the uh, Evo can explain explain later the Ethereum part. But what Eternity is using uh, is using Bitcoin NG, which is uh, a protocol similar to Bitcoin and similar to EOS, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, where um, we have two types of blocks: we have key blocks and micro blocks. So on every key block, uh, there is uh, an election happening for the person that will be going to do the proof of work. And while the next key block is uh, generated, this person that was uh, elected can generate as much uh, micro blocks as possible. Basically, he is only signing them with his public key. So this only, uh, so the bottleneck here is how fast he can sign those. Uh, transactions and those blocks. Yeah, it's related to computing power, basically, not uh, time. Yeah. This is the on chain part, though. Yeah, the on chain part. And the uh, off chain part, um, state channels, which currently are supported on Ethereum as well, but Eternity um, supports them on protocol level. And basically, you can open a state channel quite easily. You can interact with smart contracts in the state channel. And basically, as Ivo mentioned, you cannot, uh, you basically won't, um, you're able to like in interact in this state channel as long as you want. You can open it now and close it two years later. So this is uh, a big step for scalability in lots of uh, ways. So um, I think that on-chain scalability is important, um, but not as important as people think it is, and especially not as not very important now. And it's kind of a solution waiting for a problem right now. There are so many companies, there are hundreds, hundreds of companies working on blockchain on base layer scalability, and the base layer scalability is not needed. Um, and this is precisely because of solutions like state channels and payment channels and in general layer two, 
Uh, but layer two is not magic. Uh, at some point, you need to settle. Like, for example, you need to re rebalance a channel or something like this. It's quite complicated to explain to people who are not familiar with payment channels, but people who are familiar know exactly what, I'm, what, what I say. And if, if the whole world is using payment channels to pay each other, the load on the blockchain would be much less, but it would be, uh, would be much less than if any, everyone was doing on-chain transactions, but it's still much more than it is right now. So we do need on-chain scalability, but we don't need it right now. Um, and the story of Ethereum with scalability is not great. Uh, I could say that it's kind of a shit show in many ways. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, Ethereum 2.0, while being very well designed theoretically and um, really worked on by a lot of people, it, has, it kind of has this problem of governance where decisions are really difficult to make uh, and people cannot agree on anything. And Ethereum 1.0 has, has the same problem with, as Bitcoin. Uh, it cannot change. And the, pro, the, the issue, the, the, the reason it can change is that no one can agree to anything. And there are these weird political wars now, especially with Polkadot, uh, which is made by the same team that made Parity, um, which kind of froze froze Ethereum, froze Ethereum's progress, but it's not as bad as it sounds. And the reason is that we have so many layer two solutions and right now we can do so many things in layer two that we can get adoption and we can actually get business traction without needing uh, the layer one to, to actually update. Uh, we can live on this current kind of shitty Ethereum that, that is right now, but it is pretty secure. Um, so we, we can use that for a long time with layer two solutions. So for use, uh, we have scalability from two perspectives. Uh, the, the first perspective if, is from that perspective. Uh, the idea there is that uh, we are using resources that we can easily scale with them. And the example I love to give is with Facebook. Let's say if you are Facebook and we have today like 10,000 users. And tonight we are going to be on CNBC and we are expecting like um, another 50,000 users. What we need to do in order to, um, to get all the users and to be sure that our server servers won't go down, we need to buy new servers and to scale the whole structure that will help us to uh, get all of these new users. Uh, in use, you don't need to buy any servers for your app. Uh, you just need to buy use tokens and st stake these use tokens for different type of resources. You have three types, which is RAM, CPU, and net bandwidth. And you can do that in a matter of like in less than two minutes. I mean, it's so easy. Uh, so this is from the DAP perspective. Uh, from blockchain perspective, uh, probably, as you know, UC is uh, famous with that. It can scale easily and it's scalable uh, blockchain. Uh, most of the people probably don't know about the context-free actions in use. Uh, we have two types of actions in use. When I say action, this is like a function on Ethereum, like just operation, uh, which we need to execute. So the context-free operation, we have the base code for them in use. And they can actually help us to integrate scalability, uh, how, how do you call them, protocols like Chardon, uh, sh sharding. Sh sharding, Radon, uh, state channels, uh, so I think, I think we are going to see in the future a lot of these things coming to use. Uh, for the past one year, uh, I mean, the, the blockchain is developing really fast, and I'm expecting probably the next year to see something like that on use. So maybe one point that I would like to mention is that Eternity and the Ethereum are currently proof of work. Blockchains and EOS is um, DPoS, which is delegated proof of stake. And the delegated proof of stake is considered to be more scalable. Also comes with some, let's say, governance, um, yeah, tr trade offs. Um, and just one thing to mention about state channels what Eternity is currently working on. 
our state channel developers are trying to uh, upgrade the state channels that we currently have to uh, virtual state channels. And this is related to the idea that you need to, in order to have a state channel opened, you need to do it on-chain. Once you open it, then you can interact with a peer, one peer, uh, basically unlimited, for an unlimited time. And then when you want to get the, let's say you're like the moving tokens around, sending to him, he's sending to you. And when you, you stop your interaction, you need to do one more transaction that brings those like final balances on chain. So you do two transactions. And what we are trying to, to do in, in eternity is to uh, allow one user, once it opens a channel, to be able uh, to open a channel with a different user without having to go uh, on chain again. So basically you open once a channel, then you, uh, when you are in the off chain state, you have a number of users that you can connect, then you can start interacting with them uh, or with somebody else and so forth. Uh, and nonetheless, at one point, you will have to again go off chain. But the, the good idea, the, the good thing here is that the fact that you'll be able to interact with more users than just one. Uh, and this is, uh, we expect to, to have this um, in the third scheduled fork, which is in September. And maybe questions now? Yeah, do we have questions from the audience? Thanks. So my question is like two questions, uh, and that involves a topic that I'm hyped about. It's about zero knowledge proofs, so what do you think? is the future of scaling with zero knowledge proofs and what are the networks doing about it because I'm familiar what happening in Ethereum world uh, in uh, involving uh, zero knowledge proofs but I'm not familiar with any work done in uh, Eternity or use. So for those that are not familiar with zero knowledge proofs, that is basically a cryptographic term for, and a way for you to prove something without revealing the information that you have. For example, I can prove you that I am allowed to drink beer without revealing my age. Uh, currently, I'm not aware that uh, somebody is if somebody is developing something like a, a framework or something on eternity. But uh, I suppose in the nearest future, when the ecosystem grows, there will be some people that are into this topic and developing. There is like five, of five solutions for Ethereum, maybe, for zero knowledge proof scalability. Um, but I don't think it's going to lead anywhere because the problem with uh, zero knowledge proofs is that while they're very hyped and very hot, uh, you require a lot of computational power to generate them and then a lot of computational power to prove, uh, which is not playing well with some consensus mechanisms. Because usually in a consensus mechanism, you often need to like communicate with other peers and uh, or, or be uh, free in order to do proof of work. Um, so a lot of these solutions don't play well with consensus mechanisms and are generally kind of weird. Um, just like, Scaling Ethereum's current transaction throughput four times or five times requires crazy amount of additional computational power on the server, uh, and it, it probably won't scale with a larger network. So uh, while it could be something to it, I don't see it as viable for now, even though it's interesting. What I mean to say is that there are many other more interesting and more viable and more like engineering-friendly solutions. For reals, uh I'm not sure if there is something like zero knowledge proof right now, but I know that there have been some discussion on it. Uh, and it's really interesting to news that most of the things that we have already on Ethereum, for example, uh, we have them already on use 2 and I believe that we we'll probably see something in the upcoming months with uh, zero knowledge proof. I wish to take on an issue that was briefly touched by you. You talked about entities that are blocking progress of on non-chain scaling. 
using political means, a po a position, position of power. And so your position is, this is not a problem right now, because we can use payment channel second level solutions, although they are inferior in many ways, but we can do that, so that's not a problem. And Okay, that's my opinion, but anyway. <coughs> you say it is not a problem either way. So when more people begin using this second level, we, we will need scaling on the base layer because it is not sufficient now. But where does that, where does that future will lead us to? Uh, these, these entities, when, when it comes to that, do you think they will say, okay, fair is fair now, we'll let the base layer scale? I think in that position they will be, feel even more empowered when, when much more is at stake. And they will use their position to still get their way. That's what I think. Did you guys get the question? Just a quick question. It's a, it's a, I think generally it's a question of economic incentives so and, and governance, but I, maybe, yeah, Ivo has something to say. Uh, yeah, I, I think it literally doesn't matter. Um, and the reason is a lot of things in technology, uh, you know that there will be a problem now, but you know that people are working on a solution. And uh, until you reach the point where you need a solution to that problem, you don't really care and just push through the, the immediate threats to you. Uh, that's a lot of things in the world work that way, and this works in the absolutely same way. And if uh, if we manage to scale like magically, and the blockchain has huge issue, uh, huge usage uh, through layer two solutions, like all of the sudden, uh, then what could happen? is we could see an actual competition for layer one. Because right now there is no competition for layer one. Um, no one can really challenge Bitcoin. There is no, no much point of an actual Bitcoin rival. Um, and if this actually becomes a, a pressing issue, then we will, we will see real competition in layer one. And this is why competition exists. This is why we have independent entities building all of these solutions. We don't have to solve it through governance. We don't have to, we don't have to wait for the Bitcoin core team to make a decision. We don't have to wait for Ethereum to make a decision. They might, they might not. Uh, we can just rely on competition. And if they don't uh, scale and there is a need of scaling, then someone else will take over. So that's it. Anyone wants to? Nope. <laughs> All right. Uh, just final question for this part, I guess, up there. Okay, just say it, I'll repeat it. But please make it short. <laughs> So the question is about um, consensus uh, models and if they can help with scaling and what maybe new consensus models uh, mechanisms there exist and if they could be implemented in either of uh, any one of these three blockchains. Uh, for use, the, well, in use, uh, we are using DPoS, which is delegated proof of stake. Uh, and we have 21 block producers that are producing the blocks. So each of these 21 block producers are vaulted by the community. Uh, uh, the vaulting process is ha is happens always. Every every uh, 126 seconds, we have a new cycle where each block producer is producing 12 blocks. So uh, the, uh, I forgot the question. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, so, so uh, I think we might see something different, but not like something radical, because uh, at the moment we have sister chains like Warbly and Telos, for example, in Telos, they don't have 21 block producers. Uh, their block producers are, um, how was the word? They're cycling, they're cycling. So there is no like 
I'm 20, 21 and I'm going to produce my block as 21 block producer. Uh, in Telus, for example, they are changed a little bit the protocol and how they're uh, reaching consensus. Uh, consensus. So I believe I believe in the future we might see some uh, some differences on that, but not like something big. So I think that we have to be extremely careful with uh, consensus mechanism discussion because uh, it's usually kind of a rabbit hole and uh, every time we have a Sofia crypto meetup, I, I admit I haven't been in a long time, but usually people dig, dig on these consensus uh, things and it takes the entire meetup time. Um, but the only thing that I'm going to say, and I'm not going to go into detail, is that I'm personally excited about Polkadot solution, which is called Grandpa. Uh, and it's a hybrid between um, finality consensus based on practical business info tolerance and um, non-finality consensus, which is based on ORAND. But I know that that doesn't make any sense. Uh, it takes like 20 minutes to explain. Um, but it's kind of a hybrid between um, POS and POW, if you, if you will. Uh, and yeah, I know eternity is like that, but it's not the same. Uh, yeah, in, in, yeah, in Polkadot, the uh, block producer, in a way, is chosen in a PBFT manner. Uh, so everyone votes asynchronously, and this is computer science theory from the 80s, uh, where an entire distributed system can agree on one thing, one truth. Uh, so they uh, agree that someone is going to produce the block, and then um, until the next finality block, uh, you have various um, validators who are producing in-between blocks, so non-finality blocks. Yeah. So yeah, it's similar to Bitcoin NG, but uh, when you dig into the technical details, it's very different. Yeah, yeah I can add uh, that Eternity currently is uh, proof of work, but uh, there are plans for, I don't know, in investing work into hybrid model which involves proof of work and proof of stake. And yeah, if Vlad can. Oh, like even today, Sasha, which is our uh, main blockchain researcher and architect, uh, mentioned in the forum that he will be that he will start developing, uh, like from whatever research he has done, some uh, a possible hybrid solution between proof of work and proof of stake. Uh, and th this was actually the original idea of eternity and uh, I'm pretty sure that this hybrid solution will be implemented at some point. Changing the consensus mechanism is uh, quite quite a heavy task so I cannot really provide a, a timeline but I know that work will start soon even I think maybe it has already started. And I guess this could be the end of this part. Um, ah, sure. Yeah, so. Um, it's a very important qualification to make that uh, proof of stake and proof of work are not actually consensus mechanisms. What they are uh, is um, civil control mechanisms. So they're used to control whether an entity uh, is a certain entity and if you don't have uh, POS or proof of work, then uh, a single computer can make many, 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 many votes. Uh, and this is only one part of the consensus mechanism. The real innovation of Bitcoin was the Nakamoto consensus, which is the longest chain consensus mechanism where the most accumulated work uh, is, is the right chain. And the security model of that is really simple. Uh, you assume that, like, everyone knows the security model here, but you know about 51% attacks as well. Um, but there is also practical business info tolerance, which is the classical consensus mechanism, which is just a way of making everyone vote and distribute the votes between themselves in a way that they will all reach agreement. And PBFT and Nakamoto consensus are on one level, and then you have proof of work or proof of stake as a civil control mechanism on top of that. Exactly. Cool. Um, yes, let's go to the next part, which is decentralization. And we can start with yours. My, my favorite topic. Uh, yeah, well, uh, lots of people are saying that use is not decentralized. Uh, and I, th I think we should start with what we understand by decentralization. Do we say that something can decentralize when we have like one million nodes that cannot be like uh, in some way uh, broken or to be like uh, 
like hacked or something like that. Uh, there is one thing that uh, I think no blockchain ha have achieved at the moment, that's it to be decentralized, scalable, and to have performance. Uh, security, okay, yeah, security, yeah. Uh, at the moment, at the moment, uh, you have achieved only these, uh, just two of these three. I could say that probably the centralization is not one of the one of the things that uh, EUs is like uh, proud of. I mean, there is kind of decentralization. Most people are saying that because we we have only 21 block producers, we don't have any decentralization. But most people don't know that first. Uh, these block producers are voted by the community in a cycle where the time of each cycle is 126 seconds. And if you actually, as a block producer, this, you decide to do something that is not good for the blockchain, I mean, you can be voted out very easily in a matter of minutes. And I think that uh, a lot of people are not familiar is that uh, Actually, there is another thing called a uh, transaction as proof of stake, where they're actually bringing um, security to the system, uh, where you have like each user, when he, may, he makes a transaction, the transaction consists, it, it includes, uh, I, I think, the hash header of the of the certain block uh. you do that no so so yeah so so each no so each when when i as a user try to create a new transaction these transactions include includes a header hash from a recent block so actually with, with the time passing is like each user is participating in verifying the whole network. You cannot, uh, you cannot transfer, like, let's say if, if we have a fork and we want to transfer uh, everything to the other fork let's, to, hack the, to hack the blockchain, you cannot transfer all the transactions because they are already uh, bind with a certain block in the time. Yeah, probably. Um, I mean, this is a very complicated topic, and usually I'm not a fan of like uh, depots or anything like that. But uh, I would like to defend EOS kind of here uh, in that it does have 21 block producers, and if you assume that they are independent, which they are not, um, but if you assume that they are independent, then it actually could be a stronger security model than uh, many proof of work chains. Uh, and for example, Bitcoin has like five mining car cartels. Ethereum has like three. Um, and the new chains like... Can we have three? Yeah. Uh, the new chains not only have a, a few mining cartels, but they also have so much hash power that you can go uh, spend 5K and double spend them. Uh, so if you've locked up on some smart contract on a, um, on a new proof of work chain, if you've locked up millions, then anyone who has like 5K uh, can go and double spend you and you're probably not going to be successful because probably that developer of that chain is going to roll it back uh, through a like social consensus with their own miners, uh, but it still is not going to be good for their image. It's going to be terrible and it's going to destroy their image. And it's like a huge vulnerability of proof of work chains. So maybe like made up consensus mechanisms are okay, um, but I, I do think that there is a big future in PBFT. Uh, and also Ethereum 2.0 is kind of exploring it. Ethereum 2.0 is basically, we're, we're going to we'll use a similar consensus mechanism as Polkadot. Um, so there will be an improvement. Uh, I still believe that the most secure chains right now are the most decentralized chains right now are Bitcoin and Ethereum because of the complicated like game theory between the miners. Uh, I think that they cannot manipulate anything realistically. Uh, but still, I think that in many ways, new consensus mechanisms might be more secure than proof of work, especially for new chains. Yeah, I just wanted to add something about that. Because, uh, yeah, at the moment, 
most of the BPs which are in top 21 won't say that there is like a chi Chinese cartel at the moment. Um, I know personally a lot of the blockchain, uh, the blockchain, but the block producers which are currently helping, which are in top 21 and they are currently uh, helping the the blockchain to exist, but there is there is uh, a certain percentage of Chinese BPs which are voting for themselves, which is against the constitution of use. Uh, and this is not something that is not known. I mean, uh, almost everyone in the use community is familiar with that, even Block One, and they, they, I think it. I think it was last November, there were, there were a scandal where Huobi, Huobi Pool, which is, I think he's currently BP number one, uh, there is like vault between the different BPs which were in top 21, which is forbidden uh, in use. And there is a sta statement from Block One where they're saying that, I mean, they're not blind of what is happening and what they are trying to achieve is to have a, a, like a normal de democracy on the, on the US blockchain and if this continue to actually have like, uh, like a, a, a very big percentage on the BPs right now are from Asia uh, and if we continue to see that vote between the different BPs I think uh, Block one will definitely try to do something to return the democracy of the uh, network back to the beginning. I'm so sorry. So before giving the word to Eo, uh, before giving the, the word to Eternity, um, they, they asked the German guy um, what happens if you drive without a license and he says, oh no, it's impossible to drive without a license. And they say, but what, what if you do? And he says, no, it's impossible. So this is what relying on the constitution for a blockchain is like. The constitution says you cannot do that, but it says that you can still do it. But what happens if you do it? it but it's forbidden on the constitution. So, yeah. But it happened. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. If you if you're against the constitution, I mean, the community can 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 vote yeah. you out very easily. I know. Yeah. So they can. Yes. Not if they're bribed, though. Yeah. I mean, Let's have the. So, so yeah, just just to add a bit of a of color to the discussion, can. Can any one of you explain why actually we care about decentralization? Is it only about censorship resistance or is there something else? It's only about censorship resistance. Yep. <laughs> okay, and, and then the, the censorship resistance aspect is because, you know, we, we, uh, in the beginning in the news I mentioned about rolling back transactions. Here we talk about uh, a single company basically trying to push someone out because they don't act. Like, should that be embedded in the protocol? Shouldn't that happen? On chain instead of off chain, should you? Yeah. But, okay. Before that, can we? Yeah, talk about. Yeah, I wanted okay. to add something. Um, as we know, Bitcoin uh, is assuming the longest chain as the correct one, and it, it it's constantly micro forking. And uh, I just wanted to add that Eternity using Bitcoin NG kind of protects. Uh, like gives a better security uh, in terms of 51% attacks because if you do the simple math, uh, these micro forks allow you to uh, like use a low amount of money, lower amount of money that you be spending instead on the Bitcoin. You mean also double side? forking? Yeah. Um, and I just want to mention one thing, that decentralization kind of develops with time. So the most decentralized projects are the ones that are older, I would say, in this case Bitcoin and of course Ethereum 2014. And in time, I think if uh, the, econ the economics of the blockchain uh, are, are good and the blockchain is producing some reward applications, um, hopefully the token, maybe the price uh, goes up or, or these things happen, it, it, it becomes more attractive to miners or so economies uh, like these uh, economic incentives increase and these chains that become more interesting, better token price could become even more decentralized. So it's kind of a process. In the case of Eternity, this process has 
gone for about uh, six and a half months. So, yeah, it's still pretty early. And about, yeah, Ivan's question, anything that sh anyone wants to add? Yes. Uh, so, I think that for a moment we have to forget about the technology and we have to forget about consensus mechanisms and we also have to forget about uh, rules and papers and uh, constitutions or whatever. Uh, well, yeah, uh, my point is that game theory and incentives are king. Mm -hmm. no, nothing is more important. I, if, if the incentive is there for you to misbehave, then someone will misbehave and uh, even in a proof of work chain, even in the most secure proof of work chain, you can do this through social consensus. You can make all the miners, uh, if you have the way of convincing all the miners to update their software, they, they will. But the beauty of Bitcoin is that it figured out a way to combine technology and incentives in a way that doesn't allow people to do that. Uh, so if you build a blockchain base uh, that doesn't adhere to these assumptions and doesn't adhere to game theory and doesn't set up a good environment, uh, then you are screwed. So that's, yeah, that's it. Any questions? Um, maybe just one comment. Um, when I first got into to crypto, like a few years ago, I also thought everything should be decentralized. But now I'm starting to realize that um, as long as, I mean, even if it's relatively centralized, what you want is the people who are part of the, the network. You want them to be not perfect, but you want them to be uh, reasonable. So, I mean, you could have like super, super de decentralized and all of the people that are part of that network are all assholes, um, then it's not gonna work. And if it's like, let's say there's, there's, there's four people, like you four guys, you're reasonable guys and your network will be successful because you're all reasonable. Um, maybe you're not perfect like every single minute of every single day, but um, so yeah, I think there's, for, for my, from my own point of view, I've maybe come around a little bit that not everything needs to be, you know, scattered to the, the, <laughs> the, the ends of the, the earth. Um, but you mentioned about the, the incentive mechanisms. Even if there's a, just a few actors, you want them to you know, be incentivized to act well, so. Okay, so if there are any more questions, I would like to give, before we go to the final part, which is protocol upgrades, I would like to give the word to Ilian from Liberty Bits, because I kind of forgot <laughs> to give him the word at the very beginning. For which I'm sorry, um, and yeah, he'll give you a reminder about Liberty Bits. Yeah, thanks for the attention, uh, guys. Uh, it's about a conference which we are organizing, a total of three people, uh, enthusiasts, and um, I'm um, seeing this conference as an ethical conference who tries to solve uh, ethical problem from our daily life uh, with uh, some technology and, and, uh, and understanding rising attention and uh, make people think. So the main, the main topics are blockchain. It's not needed to uh, explain you why, but uh, blockchain uh, privacy um, using free software, uh, free software as a concept. And the last thing is uh, independent living. So the, the basic idea is um, to have independent life and, in, and decentralization because it seems that having or concentrating um, large amounts of power in, in a very few people, at the end they, they will uh, misbehave and they will, uh, they will accuse uh, all the others which are not so strong as them. So the idea of this conference is to, as I said, make people think and um, um, the win-win situation, as uh, in my opinion, for all the all the nice uh, speakers that we have, is to uh, give them a stage to um, um, uh, elaborate on these topics and and kind of uh, uh, um, yeah uh, link it to what they are doing, what they are doing in 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 matter of decentralization and independent life. So we have, I, I would say, very very uh, bright minds. Uh, like Milan, for example, this year, and uh, Tito from Waydex, etc. You will see it on last on on the site. So, yeah, really, I'm hope to 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 make the the whole full. It's 25th, uh, 25th of June in Sofia Tech Park. 
you're very welcome. And um, uh, two hours ago, I've posted a promo code in the group, in the Sofia Crypto uh, me uh, Meetup group. So you can uh, take it. And if you're considering you're not the right person for that, uh, I will very uh, much be appreciated if you share it with wherever you and just spread the word and it will be very nice. Thank you very much. LibertyBits.org. So it's uh, LibertyBits.org if you want to, to learn more. And we're going to the protocol upgrades part. Let's start with EOS again. Yeah, this is another my f uh, of my favorite topics. Uh, the reason for that is since the beginning, the EOS, uh, how many of you know the difference between EOS and EOSIO? Raise, raise your hand. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so what yeah. Do I count? So, so uh, EOSIO is the protocol which is used by EOS blockchain. Uh, EOSIO protocol is used uh, in sister chains of EOS like Telus, Warbly, Meetone. So, when we are talking about EOSIO, we could talk for each of the different sister chains. So, uh, since the beginning, they created the protocol uh, in a way that they can update the protocol very easily. So in the beginning, we, we have updates like every week. At the moment, uh, I think we have almost each month, we have a new update. And with, with each update, we have new and new features um, in the protocol itself. And this helps the blockchain to actually scale more easily or for example with the latest version uh, 1.8 they actually introduce a feature where you can actually say who is going to pay for the net and CPU resources so with this new feature the end user doesn't need to know how to use these resources or doesn't need to have like use to stack for them everything could be done by the by the, uh, by the developers. So th this is a huge thing and right now uh, for, I, I, I could be honest with you, I have uh, experience with Ethereum developing like year and a half, almost two years and I'm a EOS developer for almost a year. Uh, and basically on EOS at the moment is like a paradise for, for blockchain developers. You have like you can easily create smart contracts using C++ and another thing is that we are constant, uh, block one is constantly producing new new features. Last week they introduced an SDK for Android and iOS uh, development for EOS apps. So they're, yeah, I mean, they're, they're doing really good job with their $4 billion right now. <laughs> so um, just just to finish on the last topic. Um, yeah, I, I really agree with you in the hat about decentralization. That's all I'm gonna say about the matter, um, because there's not much a lot to talk about uh, about Ethereum and protocol updates. Um, but the funny thing is that always when I go to an Ethereum event, there's always a governance panel, and the governance panel always goes for like two or three hours of gibberish. When uh, it get it starts with something uh, concrete and a good question, it starts with a good question, then it evolves into uh, fixing the parity multisig hack, and then from then it goes to philosophy, what is governance, what is uh, the human race, um, what is a decision? Um, yes, and who am I eventually? I'm, I'm serious, yeah. So um, e every large blockchain is going to end up like this. Um, and some blockchains have even ended up arguably worse. Like, yeah, I'm not going to say names, but like Bitcoin is an example of, of problems. Everyone has seen this. And um, you could argue that on-chain solutions like Polkadot and uh, Cosmos and EOS and I don't know if Eternity has any on-chain solutions for governance, yes, but yes. all right. Yes. I don't know if on-chain solutions are practical uh, and time will tell. No one really can, can figure this out. Uh, you can only find this out through an experiment, but uh, in technical terms, um, Ethereum 
does actually have nice solutions for upgradability, but that's only for like user level upgradability, not protocol level upgradability. Uh, you could fight for a simple non-political change forever and it still might not get done. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. It's a problem for everyone and everyone that says that it's not a problem uh, is probably wrong because uh, on-chain protocol up upgrades have not been explored enough for us to know that they're uh, game theoretically secure. Um, I can add currently Eternity has a repository for uh, second layer proposals called expansions, which is similar, similar to Ethereum's apes or BIPs in Bitcoin, where uh, people can propose uh, layer two upgrades and solutions. Uh, but for layer one, for protocol level uh, protocol upgrades, uh, currently they are planned uh, for hard forks to the, till the end of the, of the year, which are gonna be including the balances of people who invested in the ICO, and also. <laughs> no, it's just one. To, uh, so we have one now, and like, like on June fifth. Yeah. And then we have one in September, and from there on, maybe there will be more, but I don't know if there will be more. Most probably, there could be one more before the end of the year. Who decides what gets in the hard fork? Uh, it's the developers currently, like so the core developers. So, for example, in the case of the, our vote that we had, the governance vote that we had, which was we asked the community, guys, do you think it's a good idea? Part of the block reward, which is about uh, 350 tokens per block every three minutes, we asked uh, the, the community, do you think it's a good idea? Part of that uh, to be, uh, to be um, redirected towards a different address which is owned by the Eternity Foundation, the Eternity Crypto Foundation in Liechtenstein, and then use, use those tokens to support further development or faster development on the blockchain. So, how, so we did an on-chain vote, 30 million tokens voted. Um, they said, let's do it. And they, they, was able, they were able to select uh, an amount between so let's yeah, zero and 20%. So the final amount is 11% uh, of the block reward will be introduced or will be uh, redirected for development. And how this is going to be implemented is with the next fork. And actually this is done by the Eternity Corn team. And what, I'm, what I want to see next, like in the, uh, in the uh, before the next hard fork, which is in September, is actually a community vote, community on-chain vote that is coming from the community, voted by the community and wh whoever has tokens, and that is possibly implemented by the community itself. So the, the different changes that are required on the protocol level are done by the community. And actually, this is the goal of eternity, to have the community deciding the, the fate of the protocol uh, in, in the future. But this was just like the first one was a, something like an experiment. Um, and we learned a lot. So the next, the next, uh, the next vote, um, I already am trying to uh, start a discussion in the forum with the developers from the Eternity Core team and with the entire community on how the next governance vote will be um, implemented and how the, the protocol upgrade will actually happen uh, in the future, the next protocol upgrade will happen. Yeah. We That's not binding. We end up no. on governance no, 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 no. talk again. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, and actually, whatever the developers, out, the Eternity developers propose as a protocol change, the final arbiter of that will be the miners. So if the miners, they don't update their nodes with the newest software, then the actual protocol change will not be uh, introduced. So uh, the community and the Eternity team can propose whatever they like, but if the miners don't agree on that, they they cannot like they can just simply not update uh, update their notes, and yeah, not approve these updates. Yeah, and that's the only model that works right now, and the only model that we surely know that it works for ten years. So uh, everything else is just an experiment. Uh, but if we want truly on-chain governance, then I believe the only a viable solution right now is actually Polkadot because uh, the uh, logic of the chain is actually a piece of code. Uh, it's uh, using the WebAssembly technology, so like uh, virtual machine code. Uh, and this uh, code can actually be uh, upgraded on-chain through an on-chain vote. Actually, I believe EOS has that as well. Yeah, I, I 
Yeah, in Tezos, yeah. I, j I just wanted to say that I really like the approach of I Eternity to have like community voting and to have uh, such kind of uh, approach for the blockchain itself because uh, we have the same thing on use. We have the use referendum where everyone from the community or from the BPs can propose something and uh, everyone can vote for this thing and if passed it will be it will be uh, implemented on the blockchain it can be uh, i mean all kind of things from protocol level to like uh second la layer solution or just change the user agreement mm -hmm. i don't have anything to add all right so questions from the audience uh, So my question is how do you, uh, why do you think that uh, these governance models are actually a community vote when you're actually taking in account and making the vote based on tokens uh, and coins? Uh, like what happens if I'm like 90% um, of the vote comes from my own tokens and actually there's five people voted for that? So it was uh, it was mentioned that governance is hard, and actually blockchains are doing basically research and development in governance mechanisms. How can you do governance better? Uh, and with tokens, which are at the same time currency and at the same time something like a a ballot that you can use uh, for for voting. Um, so the idea of the, uh, maybe I'll just focus on the one vote, one token, one vote mechanism is that if you have more tokens, uh, you will be more affected in the end if the decision that is taken is bad or, 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 or good. So you are incentivized, economically incentivized to, to try to figure out which is the best solution forward. Um, and um, then whatever the, the result is, you, you get affected by it. So even in, in your case, if one person has 90% of all uh, whatever is being voted on, uh, they will be most affected at the, in the, with the result after. So if it was something bad that nobody else wanted or wanted to use, so they, their token value could go down after that. So it's again a game, a game theoretical model that is used in, in this type of governance. You mentioned the question is what is bad and what is good and for whom? Well, it, it's again, it depends what, what is being voted on. So it depends what the vote is. If for one vote, like if somebody is voting for himself or something, I mean, there are so many different, uh, like different cases, uh, I mean, we can talk to for all of them, but it will take maybe hours. Yeah, there are things called uh, like quadratic voting, but if we go there, we need to have a working solution for identity on chain. So at least for now, I think every on chain voting is done weight based. So how how much tokens you have, that much uh, voting power you have. I mean, uh, I think everyone is forgetting that it's not a binding vote. If five people vote and uh, the outcome is something stupid, then the next level of decision is on the developers and then the final decision is on the miners. In the case of Eternity, um, Ethereum, Bitcoin and many others. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a good question, yeah. but yeah. it doesn't come an answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. Um, so, because you ask everyone who has tokens to vote, and then it's up to them to actually use those tokens to, to, to do a vote. And some of them will be more active, and some will not be that active. But it's a community vote in the sense that everybody has the opportunity to participate in that vote and to have their uh, vote um, right, registered on the blockchain. Yeah, I think I, think, uh, I understand what you're saying. Uh, for example, um, Let's say in use you have 1,000 tokens, like this is everything. If, if you have like 100 tokens of 
the whole thing, you you have like I think 10% of the all resources of the network. So actually, uh, when you're voting or for a BP or where you're voting for some new feature that need to be implemented in the use referendum, because you have tagged more used tokens for voting, your voting power will be bigger from people who have la like let's say like one percent. So uh, this is these have bad and good side. The good side is that people don't vote. I mean, this is not a problem of the blockchain, this is a problem of us as, as people. And we see the same problem when we need to vote for something on the, on the use referendum. And in order to, pa let's say we need a certain feature which is really important and we, we need to, that thing to pass. But we, if we don't have like, I think for use was like 50% of all votes, I'm not sure about that, but if we do not pass this thing, it's not going to be implemented. And what it's, I mean, this could happen once, then twice, and what will happen if we don't reach agreements? And in this case, people who have more voting power, I mean, they, they, the bad thing here is that they could vote because they could, could gain more money because of that. But another thing is that there could be like normal people like us and just decide what is better for the network and, and what's not. And in this case where they're voting, they're actually hoping to achieve a uh, new implementation for the protocol. So it's a bit tricky here. And yeah. Um, yeah, just one final thing that I would like to say. Well, this, was, this was about protocol upgrades, but I guess, yeah, on-chain voting is related to that. Um, the, the, the great thing with blockchain or on-chain voting that I see personally is that the feedback or the implementation of whatever you're voting on gets uh, like realized very quickly. Unlike, for example, in a, in a like normal democracy when you vote for a party and then they need to deliver in the next four years, and for four years you don't, you, you, you cannot do anything. In the case of on-chain voting, you vote for something, it's being voted on, then it's implemented in the protocol, and you see the result immediately. If it was a bad decision, for example, increasing increasing the block size or or, inc or decreasing it or whatever. Uh, then, then, then actually you can see the effects of it. Uh, let's say the, the distribution of the blocks around the network uh, gets uh, like slows down. You get more chains happening. The protocol falls down or whatever. Like you, you have uh, easier ways to do attacks. This immediately affects you as a user of that network who owns these tokens uh, because the network value goes down and you are immediately affected. Uh, it's it's basically this this idea that you, the the money, you use the money to, to do a vote. Uh, and I think this quick feedback that uh, blockchains allow is something very, very, uh, very good. And also the, the whole transparency and security of voting is something that, uh, that blockchains bring. And um, I think on-chain voting is something very interesting. Uh, it will continue to be very interesting. A lot of projects are experimenting with it in various, like all kinds of ways. And um, yeah, slowly it will become a thing, and hopefully people, when when like they know that whatever is being voted on will have a direct effect, like tomorrow, on their pockets because their tokens value goes down, they will get more activated and maybe like participate in more more votes. Um, and yeah, that's it. <laughs> Um, you, you really have to clarify whether you mean on-chain voting uh, or on-chain governance and uh, whether you mean binding votes or non-binding. And the difference is uh, if you have an on-chain vote that's set up to be binding, when the on-chain on vote happens, whatever is decided gets applied on-chain automatically in, in uh, like smart contract way. So an example for that would be increasing the block size. But like protocol upgrades can also kind of be voted on chain, but it's a really important distinction to make. Because yes. when you say on chain voting, people might think that it's just voting and then the developers have to respect that. And another thing that I would like to say is um, people who dislike on chain governance usually make this argument, and I really like this argument, that uh, even if you have on chain voting and it's binding, and uh, the on chain uh, 
vote goes in one way and goes to increase block size, then if you have a social consensus between the miners, then this always overrides the on-chain vote. Mm -hmm. So social consensus between the miners is king in these systems or the validators or whatever it is. So yeah, so governance is always related to um, yeah consensus mechanisms, so and also um, Sibyl attack mechanisms, which is proof of work. So I guess with uh, proof of stake and other uh, consensus mechanisms, on-chain voting or governance also changes, and these are very dynamic systems, and we will see them move. Like currently, is one thing is happening, then they will evolve into something else. But as I said, it's governance, it's uh, research. Research, uh, basically research, applied research on the on the blockchain uh, layer, and it's something very exciting. Um, no matter how many different uh, like versions are, or what's going to happen in the in in the end, govern on chain governance is super interesting. At least um, I think so. Any questions from the audience? Final questions. One question, okay. Uh, I would like to ask up, uh, about uh, the three uh, blockchains that you represent in terms of uh, attracting new developers. Uh, which one is the most uh, user-friendly or gives more tools and things like that? I want to limit the answer to up to a minute per project because <laughs> everyone has an incentive to go long. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. I can start. Yeah. So be, Eternity being so young project, there are uh, less developers at this point, but uh, the ecosystem and all of us developing there are involved some way, uh, somehow in developing the tools that are needed for new developers to jump in and start easier uh, using the blockchain. There are uh, tools like 4JE, um, SDKs for different, different languages, uh, wallets and other tutorials, uh, documentation hubs and stuff like this that are uh, trying to lower the barrier for a new developer or developer from other chain to like make the transition smoother. I have 10 more seconds. Uh, and w through the Eternity Crypto Foundation, anyone who is facing some issues by like in developing their apps, they can apply for funding for their, uh, for their research, so to say. And if, uh, if it's not for profit, what you're doing, like the app that you're creating, if it's not for profit, you, you can get funded to actually develop the tools even further or develop the, the, the tools, uh, functions that you need yourself and get like funded for, for that. And once you get this, you help actually the entire ecosystem who now have, a, let's say, an improved SDK or an improved uh, Python implementation or whatever. Uh, none, of, none of our blockchains are friendly. Um, <laughs> and uh, Eternity uses a, a, weir a weird functional language. Uh, EOS uses like the worst language of all, the most complicated language C++, uh, and it's a minefield. Uh, but at least, uh, I mean, they have one advantage, someone can give you money to develop on them. Uh, but uh, you, you, can find, you can find many, many, many tutorials about Ethereum, and just when you go on GitHub and search for Solidity source, source code, you will find uh, maybe thousand times more than the other two. So. That's it, Objective, uh, objectively the most popular. So my, my, my opinion is based on my experience as a Ethereum and use developer. And for me, yeah, most of people are saying that uh, the smart contracts on use uh, are written in C++, but most people don't know that they don't need to care of memory management and stuff like that. I mean, everything is, everything is is done on protocol level. So from the developer experience, we don't have so much tools like on Ethereum, uh, but like we are just one year year, uh, year old. Uh, and for me, it's super easy for a new developers to start developing on EOS. C++ is not, it's not a problem at all. There is a ton of uh, tutorials how you can write C++. It's like, I think over 30 years language, there is lots of libraries you can use. Exactly. Yeah, which are used by lots of big companies and game companies. So, uh, and as I said previously, right now is a paradise that's used for blockchain developers. Okay. Uh, C++ is not one language. Everyone writes different C++. <laughs> 
Any questions? Or we sh Okay, so it was a long discussion. I think it was a very interesting one. Thank you. <laughs>